Well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, my name is Michael Goldstein. Uh, Jing uh, and Dave were kind enough to invite me out to the fabulous Las Vegas to uh, talk to you guys about Bitcoin, um, coming in from San Francisco. Uh, so I run a website called the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute, which uh, curates uh, literature from the cypherpunks and crypto anarchists, uh, as well as uh, does economic analysis of Bitcoin and uh, some Bitcoin history type stuff. Uh, I'm also an, an engineer at 21Co, uh, which is a Bitcoin company. Um, anything I say here does not reflect employer, yada, yada, yada. Um, so uh, this is going to be just a, a very, very high level overview of how Bitcoin operates. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of hand waving over some of the crypto stuff, but uh, if you have questions, uh, either I or especially for the crypto, Dave um, can, can walk you through uh, anything you wanna understand. Uh, but this is, Bitcoin is a, a very, very large topic. Uh, so cramming it down to size, otherwise we'd be here for days um, trying to cover everything. Um, so I wanna help uh, anyone who's not familiar with Bitcoin yet kind of get, uh, dip their toes in the water and uh, give you some resources so you can uh, move forward if, uh, if this interests you. Interest you uh, and it should. I consider Bitcoin um, among the greatest uh, inventions in human history. Uh, hopefully we'll get to why uh, if we have time, but basically in a nutshell, uh, we have this major problem with money and money money as a concept up until 2009 was completely pwned. So um, all, of, all of our monetary systems were run by, by centralized organizations that could confiscate our money, they could freeze our accounts, they could um, inflate our money away to devalue it. Um, they, could, they could do all these things and there's basically nothing we could do. The, the costs of gold, uh, to store gold are so high that it's infeasible for us to be able to, you know, you know keep large stores of it at home. Uh, this is why we moved to banks, and as soon as we moved to banks, they start finding ways to, uh, you know, mess with the supply of money, make up, you know, some questionable loan contracts that, you know, lead to fractional reserve banking and all the, all the issues that come from that. So uh, there's just, n unfortunately though, there's not a way around it. In fact the money system that we have now, it beat out gold because it's actually very useful uh, and great, but it does have these, these flaws from being centralized, um, where uh, specific organizations that run it can make up the rules as they please uh, to the benefit of themselves um, and to the detriment of us. Um, so the problem is when we're trying to make a, a digital cash, uh, the key problem is called the double spending problem. <coughs> The issue is that if I if I make a digital message that says this is a dollar or a you know whatever unit uh, of money and I give it to someone, uh, uh, digital information is is easily repl replicable. So I can copy that and I can just give the exact same message to someone else, and now they think they have the dollar. So it's very it's very difficult to you know be able to trust that like someone gave me a piece of digital cash um, that was not also given to someone else because then you're, you're double spending and you're cheating, um, all that. So you have to you know, set up systems, you know, like when you, when you use PayPal or Visa or one of these networks to, to transmit money to someone, you, you're sending a digital message to that person, but you're also communicating with a, one of those centralized institutions uh, who goes through their big ledger, checks for fraud, does all this stuff, um, to make sure that it was, it was valid. And if it was, then according to them, um, it's a valid transaction and the money is moved. Uh, but the issue, like I said, you know, PayPal is notorious for freezing accounts. Um, and you also, you have all kinds of uh, fraud issues and stuff, stuff like that. So this was a major problem that existed uh, in human history since the dawn of man uh, until 2009, uh, starting actually, uh, I guess it was October 31st, 2008, a pseudonymous entity by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto showed up on the cryptography mailing list uh, with a white paper for a thing called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And uh, Satoshi proposed a solution for this whole thing by uh, making a decentralized money, a decentralized uh, cash system uh, that is not controlled by any sing single organization um, and does uh, and thus does not allow them to devalue the money, steal money from us, etc. 
Um, so the question is like, how does that work? How does this actually solve that problem? And it does it with an interesting uh, data structure called a blockchain. And a blockchain is uh, basically a, it's a public ledger that has all of the, the accounting for the entire network uh, and it's, it's available to everyone. And so it has, it has blocks and you can think of blocks like a page in a ledger book. Like it has every, every page in the ledger will have another set of transactions. And then you add when you want to uh, make transa transactions on the network, you get it written on a page and it's put, uh, put into the book uh, in order in, in the blockchain. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what's actually going on here. Now, every block has a bunch of transactions and we'll talk later about how these are structured. Um, and there's, there's a Merkle root, so it's using something called a Merkle tree, which we'll get to. And then every, every block is pointing to a previous block so that you know that it's, it's building on a previous, um, a previous set of transactions um, so that you're not, uh, you're not replicating. So if something gets moved here, it shouldn't also be moved here to a different address. That would not make sense. And so by uh, pointing, pointing back to a block, you can, you can keep this story going uh, and everyone can, everyone can know what's going on. Um, so this is just a very simple one of what's going on. Um, but first we have to get into like how, how can we actually make this decentralized? Because if everyone, if everyone is just sharing a bunch of transactions, how, how do we as a group uh, all around the world, this is a global system with people who uh, both like Bitcoin, people who uh, uh, just want to make some money off Bitcoin, uh, and some people who hate Bitcoin and want to destroy it. So you have a very adversarial uh, network. How do you find a way to get everyone to actually agree on what is in this? If someone just puts out a block, and says, hey, I'm making a new set of, uh, like a new page of transactions for the network. How do I get everyone on the network to agree that that's actually the one that everyone moving forward is going to base off of? So that the next person, when they, when they use a hash for the previous one, they, they do it to that. So uh, Satoshi came up with something called proof of work. Um, and it's based off a, a algorithm um, made in the 90s by, by a cypherpunk named Adam Beck called Hashcash, which was made for email spam. And the idea was um, someone would attach to their email a number that was provably difficult to create. Um, so using, using SHA-256. So uh, I know Dave has given some crypto talks, so is everyone familiar with hash functions? Okay, so, so um, to, to make a SHA-256 hash of a given criteria is very difficult because of the randomness uh, of the hash. So if you can make a hash that has a criteria, then statistically it took some amount of computational power uh, to be able to produce that. And so Hashcash was using that, using that for email, uh, an algorithm like that, so that um, you could show that you put some computational power in, in delivering an email so that when someone receives the email and it has that stamp on it, you can, you can know that it's not spam. Like they had to actually work to do it because if someone wants to spam doing this, they would have to make a new stamp for everyone. It would, it would cost them way too much to be able to do that. So Satoshi uh, used that for the purposes of uh, uh, creating consensus on the network. So the way by which uh, the Bitcoin network is able to agree uh, on a consensus on, on a, a history of transactions is by using this proof of work, by forcing everyone who wants to add a, uh, a block to the blockchain, they have to prove that they, they did some amount of computational power, and that's called proof of work. So this way, in order to be a dishonest player in the network to add to this, um, it, cost, it costs more than anything you'd get out of it. Um, and at the same time, uh, sorry, let me, let me go back. Uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, best way to put this. Basically, um, everyone needs to know 
what to put it on next. If you are the one who finds the criteria, like the, the hash that allows you to create the block to put this on, um, you, you broadcast this block to the network. Um, and if you have, uh, the criteria, by the way, is a certain number of zeros at the beginning of the, uh, the, the hash. So at the very beginning, it was, it was very simple to create one of these. You, would, you, you could turn on your laptop and start mining blocks. Um, however, there's also a difficulty function that's able to keep this from uh, growing too fast. So the idea is statistically we should get a block every 10 minutes. So at the very beginning, it was, it was very easy. Uh, but then as, as a network grows, someone might show up that has tons of computers, like uh, tons of computational power, and they can easily produce uh, as many hashes of they, as they want of that criteria. So the network listens in, and every two weeks, is able to adjust that difficulty so it becomes that much more difficult. Uh, in this case, you know every every zero that you expect to be at the beginning that makes it exponentially more difficult um, to to produce uh, the hash necessary. The next people, and by the way, so if you produce that block, um, there's a first transaction that you include in the block every time called a Coinbase transaction, and this is this is where the uh, reward comes from. So um, whenever someone mines a block, they receive some coins on the network, and they do it by making basically a blank check to themselves. They get to put in whatever address they want, and they can say, send 50 bitcoins uh, to me. And so the network started off at uh, 50 bitcoins every block, and someone would uh, put in a transaction. Um, they would be looking for a nonce, so they'd, they'd be adding a number to this to this uh, whole data structure, adding a number, putting all of that through SHA-256, and seeing what the output was. And if it met the criteria, then it was a valid block, and they'd, they'd uh, broadcast it to the network. Now the next person, if they want to, um, if they want to add a block to the network, they can ignore this if someone made a valid one. However, someone, uh, the, the network has already heard about that block, and as soon as they hear about it, they don't want to waste any more time trying to build off this previous block, because everyone has heard on that one, and if, if everyone has heard about that one, they're going to give up and be like, okay, I'm going to start on a new block um, and try to find uh, a new one. And the more this happens, it means that if you want to rewrite the history of Bitcoin, um, and you've already you're a few blocks back, not only do you have to find you know, the criteria once, um, like that, that difficulty once uh, to make a new block, you have to do that exponentially um, for the blocks past faster than the other people are able to get even one block out. Because as soon as they get even one more block out, it becomes even more, like exponentially more difficult and it keeps going. And so this way, the network is able to converge on an agreement of, um, how it's done, and people people want to be adding their uh, uh, computational power to this effort because of that Coinbase transaction, because of the block reward, giving them giving them money uh, as a reward. Um, so you can imagine had you had you mined you know 50 bitcoins a couple blocks you know back in in 2010, you'd, you'd be very happy today. Um, so that is that is how the the consensus is able to form. And an entire network of even adversarial people is able to agree on a history of transactions um, without anyone, any single person, uh, you know, signing off on things. Um, so this is the block reward schedule. This, it actually is a uh, there's a fixed money supply in Bitcoin because the block reward follows a, a geometric curve. So as I said, it started off at um, 50, 50 bitcoins per block, but every four years there's a halving of that. So then it became 25 per. And then um, just earlier this year, in I guess it was July, uh, it halved again. And so now a miner who successfully finds uh, a valid block receives 12.5 bitcoins. And this will continue um, until it's you know it's asymptotic, and eventually there will be no there will be no more than roughly. Uh, 21 million bitcoins on the network, and because everyone has been agreeing on that 
um, that history, there's no way to, uh, unless you can, can convince everyone to change the, the protocol and you know, make their money uh, worth less, there's no way uh, to go back and, and add more money to that. Um, so no one's able to inflate the money away. Um, no one's able to do the double spending. Um, and that's all uh, decentralized. Uh, no, no one organization in charge. Um, so I said there is the, uh, when, when we put these transactions in the blockchain, the way the actual block work, the block itself doesn't actually contain all of the transactions, it just, it just contains the Merkle root. And uh, a Merkle tree is a data structure where you line up all the transactions and then you take two at a time and you put them together and you find the hash of that and you go down the line. Uh, this is an example, this last one, there, there was an odd number of uh, uh, transactions, so they just put E and E together and they hash that. And then you take AB and CD and you put those together, or the hashes of those, you put those together, make a hash of that, and you keep going all the way up until you get to the top, and this would be the Merkle root. And this is what, what actually goes in the block. Um, we'll get to why that's important. Um, other uses of this data structure is used in uh, uh, BitTorrent to help uh, keep track of pieces of data that you've received and make sure that um, you're, you're getting everything. Um, so the reason this is uh, useful, so every, every person on the Bitcoin network can download the entire blockchain, uh, which is now you know, quite a large file, I believe it's about 100 gigabytes or so. Um, so it's gotten quite large, but anyone can download it and by downloading the entire set of blocks and the entire set of like all the transactions, they're able to verify every single thing that happens on the network uh, themselves, rather than having to call up PayPal and ask if uh, uh, you know things are things are kosher. So, um, so a a full node is a person who runs a Bitcoin uh, node that downloads this entire data structure and is is validating the blocks, verifying transactions, um, and that means that when they send money out. They don't have to trust anyone else in the world as to uh, what is the what is the what is the balance, uh, so to speak, of their their Bitcoin addresses. Uh, where was their money? Was their money successfully sent? All that they have that information, and it's been information that has gone through this consensus, and so they 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 know that this is how the network is, without having to ask anyone. Now the interesting thing is because of the way the Merkle uh, tree operates, a person who wants to know just about their Bitcoin addresses and, and transactions don't actually have to have the entire copy of the transactions. Instead, uh, anyone, if they have just you know this hash and they're looking for the information about transaction three, they just have to have the pieces of that Merkle tree that transaction three is part of. So going up the tree um, there. So they need these hashes and this hash and they go up to the root. But they don't have to download the whole thing. So what this means is if you have a wallet on your phone um, or on your computer, you can have one that um, instead of downloading 100 gigabytes of information, you can just download the, the parts you need to have full knowledge of uh, a transaction successfully being found in a block, meaning it's verified and all that. Uh, without needing that, and that's that's of course very useful because it'd be it'd be a pain to have to download that much on a phone. Synchronization is, is a rather slow process, uh, otherwise. And so these these are called uh, SPV nodes, um, which I'm actually <laughs> uh, unfortunately forgetting what the the it stands for. But Something partial verification. <laughs> simple simple, simple <coughs> payment verification. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So simple payment verification, and, and that way you can you see just the transactions you need. Um, and so a node, a node is only downloading these parts plus those hashes. So this is a, a simplified version of that. So what makes up a Bitcoin transaction? Because in Bitcoin, there's no actual coin. There's no, there's no like people, people get confused because they, they think that there's like an actual unit of something that's like sent to, to one another, but really, Remember, we talked about the blockchain as a big accounting book. So it's really just a ledger. 
um, and every every transaction in it is just uh, information about a transfer of of a unit, uh, a number basically uh, on the ledger from from one uh, uh, key pair to another. So. Um, what a traffic transaction is, is actually just a set of inputs and a set of outputs. Those inputs come from unspent outputs from other ones. So the Coinbase transaction that we talked about earlier, that is the only transaction type you'll find on the network that does not have inputs because it is the beginning of a, a, uh, you know, a chain of transactions. And so it, it does not require that. Um, but since they've provided the proof of work, we can we can trust it and all that. Um, so a any any time that someone spends a Bitcoin, what we're looking for is can we trace that transaction back? So we, we look at the the inputs of those transactions. Can we see that those were the outputs of a valid transaction? Were those uh, outputs that are used as inputs? Were those outputs from another valid transaction? going all the way back to a Coinbase. So here people people use their their uh, public-private key pair to, to sign a transaction, um, and that output just points to the next one, and so on and so forth. And people can combine uh, outputs, so you can, you can take you know, 20 outputs, um, make them inputs to another transaction, and spit out one output uh, for that transaction, uh, and you can also split them as well. So one output can be one one unspent output can be an input to a transaction that then has you know twenty outputs. Um, so once again, the transactions are these this chain that goes back to the Coinbase. Uh, there's not there's not actually a, a coin that's floating through the the ether. And what actual what every transaction is those outputs they're actually all computer programs. Bitcoin has a, a scripting language called Script that is, uh, it's a fourth-like uh, stack language. Um, so this, a, a standard, you've probably seen Bitcoin addresses before perhaps, uh, where it's a long, it's like one and then a bunch of, of random uh, letters and numbers. Um, and then someone would send, you know, they, they scan the QR code and they send money to it. What they're actually doing is creating a transaction that was taking an output that looked like this computer program, attaching a signature, and then broadcasting it to the network. And what this uh, what this computer program does, I don't have like a whiteboard, I can I can like you know work it out with you, but if someone wants me to do that with them later, basically it they <coughs> um, they first stack their signature, they, they signed a message with their public private key, and then they put the public key so they're stacking that on top, and then the dupe comes on, and what that does is copies the public key, and then you hash it, uh, the top one, uh, you, you find the hash of it, and then you stack uh, what they give is the public uh, key hash, which would be the address, and then equal verify makes sure that that's actually the same uh, hash um, that they're providing. So it's like, I'm actually providing the correct public key here uh, to be working with, and then finally, uh, the check sig takes all of that and makes sure that uh, the signature is correct. Was this a signature that was used with a private key that's actually tied to this public key? So every single output on a transaction is one of these little computer programs. So the way you can think about it is that every output of a transaction is is basically a puzzle, and the person who has the solution to that puzzle, which typically comes in the, the form of a, uh, a simple um, uh, signature, uh, can solve it, and then it can be a valid input for a new transaction, and that new transaction would be them uh, spending it to the place they'd like. Um, so when someone sends you a Bitcoin, uh, you're basically locking it up in a, a computer program that only you can solve. Uh, now, what is also interesting is you can then uh, you can actually, instead of a simple address which just maps to a, a public-private key pair, you can also make addresses that are hashes of entire computer programs unto themselves. And so people can uh, 
basically they can use the the script language to construct uh, some some conditions by which they should be able to spend uh, the coins, which and we'll get to some of those uh, later. And they can make a hash of that script, and someone can send to that hash, and it would just it's the same way as sending to an address. Once again, if you you have defined uh, the conditions like um, you know I need two signatures from these two public keys in order to uh, spend these coins, you can make that a computer program with script, you make a hash of that and someone sends it to that. And then when the, the bit, Bitcoin, when a Bitcoin transaction uh, is sent to that address, then you have to fulfill those conditions of, of providing two signatures uh, for those uh, public keys in order to make a valid one to be able to spend it. So <coughs> only the people who have access to those keys would be able to uh, spend that. So keys and addresses. So Public keys, public-private keys in Bitcoin are based on elliptic curves, um, which Dave is the person to ask if you want to learn all about the math behind that. Um, basically, they, there's a fancy elliptic curve, and you're able to find uh, two points that, um, you know, using trapdoor functions, it's very easy to derive the public key from the private key, but uh, the, the other way around is essentially impossible. Uh, unless someone at the NSA has something they haven't been telling us about, or CIA, I guess CIA, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so something in Vault 7 might, might change this, but hopefully not. So um, a way a Bitcoin address uh, is made is simply uh, you, you find a public-private key pair, and you hash uh, the public key uh, a couple times. There's a base 58 encoding. So I actually I should have put uh, an example of an address, but uh, we use base 58 so that it's uh, easier to not mess up. So it, it, for instance, does not use things like having L and I, because L and I both, you, you wouldn't know, like if L uh, and like capital I, you, it's, it's much easier to type the, the wrong thing. But if, if all of the characters are different enough, um, it's much easier to uh, transmit that and type it in, um, although QR codes help with all of that. Um, so then we get to wallets. Um, a wallet is really just a, a set of keys. Um, the traditional way of doing it, you would open the, the, the Bitcoin uh, program, Bitcoin Core is what it's called now, and it would make a what's called a, a JBOK wallet, which is just a bunch of keys. And it's literally like it would just, it would use a random number generator and make 100 random numbers at a time um, and generate the, the keys and the addresses and all that. Problem with this, of course, is if you want to back that up, say, you know, um, in Bitcoin, for, for both privacy and security reasons, whenever someone sends you a Bitcoin, uh, you want to create a new address uh, because as we talked about, the network is completely open, so you have to have, you, you don't want um, certain information to leak out by how you're using addresses. Um, there's also issues with the way that the, the signatures occur that if, if you're not careful, uh, reusing an address uh, can cause security problems. Um, so um, this, is, this is an issue because then if you've received a thousand different transactions, that means in order to make sure that in the future, at any time you can spend that money, you have to have all of those keys backed up. Um, and it's very difficult. So uh, most modern wallets, and, and Bitcoin Core has implemented this as well now, uh, use something called hierarchical deterministic wallets. And what those are is a wallet, I think, uh, yeah. So um, it's a wallet that's actually a tree structure that you only provide a seed and that random number, which will be 128 to, to 512 bits, that seed can be used to create um, a master key as well as what's called a chain code. And those two numbers together, you can create uh, a, a tree structure of um, addresses that just goes on you know, infinitely, essentially. Um, uh, and this is, this is useful for a variety of reasons. One, it means that instead of having to remember and back up, you know, a hundred uh, keys on a, on a hard drive or whatever, 
all you have to actually back up if you want to recreate all of these keys is just this one C. Uh, and other other uses for that is, for instance, if if you're a online merchant and you're receiving bitcoins, you know you can create a a child tree for every customer <coughs> as a way to keep track of and, and easily generate new addresses uh, for each person that's uh, sending you money. And so, uh, like I said, we to to do this. Um, people people use a cryptographically secure uh, random number generator. So, for instance, I like using dice, casino dice, um, you know, deck of cards, or if you have hardware you trust, um, you create that random number. And we'll get to uh, mnemonics in just a little bit. Um, this goes through some crypto magic that creates the uh, a 256 bit key, which is what those which is what an address is made from, uh, a public key, and that chain code. And that chain code is, is the information to, to make the uh, tree structure. Now, mnemonics are, um, are a way to encode that information of the seed in a way that's human memorable, because it's very difficult for me to remember, you know, 3338A6D2EE. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you can take those bits, take a dictionary of memorable words, map specific bits of that seed to that dictionary. So each dictionary, like, you know, 111 is aardvark and 112 is uh, apricot, etc., etc. Um, what you can do is break that seed into a bunch of, uh, you know, chunks, turn those into words, and then in, in order to save, uh, you know, a, a set of addresses that contain, you know, 20 bitcoins, you know, thousands of dollars, all you have to remember are these 12 words uh, that made up that seed. So this is very powerful because it means, you know, I can, I can write down some words, you know, uh, from a, a computer that, was, that, that generated the seed uh, offline. I can, uh, you know, put that away in a safe. <coughs> I can generate all the addresses I want, receive all the money I want. I, as long as I have those words hidden away somewhere, I can recreate those private keys to be able to spend them. And so any, any amount of money you can imagine can be stored in just a couple words, um, uh, which is also good. It also means, you know, if you were, if you were a high target individual, you'd be able to um, send money to an address that's that has this, and you just have to walk around remembering army, van, defense, carry, jealous, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you, you run off to Mexico, you get on a computer in Mexico, you put in this uh, seed, you can regenerate everything, spend everything, and, and spend your money. So it's, it's a very powerful uh, data structure and, uh, and uh, method for, for remembering it. Uh, now I wanna get into some of the, the I said earlier that um, you can use these scripts to do very interesting things. So because the Bitcoin transactions are effectively computer programs, you have programmable money. And that is one of the, the coolest parts of uh, Bitcoin and uh, smart contracts is a, is a term you'll hear a lot. A lot of people like to um, hype that up. Now, uh, Bitcoin already handles a number of really interesting uh, smart contracts that I'll get into. One of them is, uh, is multi-sig. So the, the, uh, you saw the, the script for just a basic address um, uh, uh, pay to uh, key pair hash uh, script earlier, like how, how to just, the, the program for just uh, spending money that was sent to an address. Now that hash that we can send things to, what this can say <coughs> is that we're going to give three public keys to the script we're going to say that two of them are necessary to spend uh, Bitcoin and that op check multi-sig when you make a transaction with this output and you provide any two of these uh, public keys with the signatures, uh, this script can be, be verified and that money can be sent. So two of three people in, uh, two of three addresses uh, need to sign something and it can be used. So what this is really cool for is stuff like escrow and arbitration. So if, if I wanted to buy something from Dave, but I don't trust him, 
we can and go. Rightly so, you should. Exactly. So, um, so we could we could find a an arbiter like Jing, um, who both of us can trust, and we can put all of our public keys uh, in a in a script, and say, okay, I'm going to send money uh, to that address. So it's in that pool now, um, and we can move that money to Dave once he gives me the thing I bought from him. Uh. Now, if if that thing that I bought from him comes to me, then everything is good, and him and I can just go ahead and, and sign a new transaction. So uh, I would send a transaction to him that he would sign, and then I would sign it, and then we'd broadcast it to the network, and it would have two of the signatures, so two of the three, and it would get sent, and that'd be good. Now, if uh, there was a disagreement, like uh, something never showed up, then I can make a new transaction with Jing that sends the money back to an address that I own. Likewise, if Jing finds that I actually did get the thing, but I was just lying, and, and Dave was actually fine, the two of them can sign a a, uh, a new transaction that sends it to Dave. Um, and so this way, you're able to put money in a more secure location. That the only way uh, you can uh, break that is if there's collusion. But like you, you need at least two of them. Um, so this this gives you opportunities for, for much uh, very interesting uh, not it's not trustless but um, uh, arbitration with less trust uh, as far as the money goes. Um, there's also uh, the ability in Bitcoin to make payment channels, which is kind of like a web socket um, for for Bitcoin. So if I'm at Dave's coffee shop and he's selling Wi-Fi, uh, I might want to pay for usage of the Wi-Fi, so like per kilobit, ki kilobyte of information that, that comes to me. So the way that I can do this with Bitcoin is I can create a, um, a, a bond with Dave, a, basically a transaction with something called lock time, which says, this transaction is not um, valid until after a given point. So like say uh, 100 blocks down the line, which would be uh, 10 minutes times uh, 100, you know, whatever that adds up. I can make a transaction that can't be spent until that, and I can give that as a, a refund uh, to myself uh, in case, in case uh, like Bob runs off without actually uh, giving me Wi-Fi or Dave giving me Wi-Fi. Once that uh, that refund exists, you don't broadcast the net, that to the network. Uh, you just hold on to it because it's not even going to be valid on the network for a while anyway. But you've guaranteed that if Dave runs away at any time, I'm getting that money back. Now, now that that's set up, we can start making new transactions where I send a transaction to Dave that I've signed that says, okay, you've, you've given me um, this much Wi-Fi, here's, here's this small amount of Bitcoins. And I give that to him and both of us have signed it. And then he gives me another packet of Wi-Fi or whatever. And I sign it again and we can increase that amount. And then when either of us have decided we're done, we can broadcast uh, that money to the network. Um, and because we've now sent in a, a transaction from that address, um, the, the refund uh, transaction, no longer it's, it's no longer going to be valid because then it would be a double spend. So the network will no longer use it. So that, that first transaction is just there, just in case uh, something goes bad and I can refund my own money. But otherwise, you basically like, uh, in, this, in this case, like it starts off with I'll pay up to a hundred bits, um, you know, a hundred units of, of uh, you know, small units of Bitcoin. And each new transaction, maybe it's like, okay, now make a transaction where uh, two of those bits go to me, or two of those bits go to Dave, and ninety-eight go to me because he gave me a little bit. And then when he gives me a little bit more, we both sign new transactions where, okay, four goes to Dave and 96 goes to me. And this goes on and on and on until either one of us want to quit. That transaction can be broadcast to the network uh, and, and it's settled. 
Um, and so with this, we're able to use the blockchain as a, a witness for very fast payments um, that don't require waiting you know, 10 minutes to get into a blockchain and, and much longer to be fully you know, confirmed by, uh, by the network. Um, so uh, this, there's, there's currently heavy, heavy development um, being done with a, uh, a protocol called the Lightning Network that basically takes this and puts it on crack so that uh, the entire Bitcoin network can be doing uh, extremely high, high uh, frequency uh, Bitcoin transactions with one another uh, without having to um, constantly you know, uh, use the blockchain uh, directly. Um, I, I forgot to mention this earlier that there's also uh, fees on the blockchain, uh, on the Bitcoin network. So a transaction is not completely free. Um, what you do, because you want a miner to have incentive to, like, why should they include your transaction in their set of transactions while they're trying to uh, get a block? And the way you do that is you offer, offer them some money. So earlier you showed uh, a graph about, like, how, you know, everything costs. Yes. Um, So, so you would the the final Bitcoin will be mined in like 2140. But even now, 80 percent of the Bitcoins have already been mined. Okay. So yeah. So what will happen? That's that's not. The, we we don't know for sure, of course. Um, but hopefully, Bitcoin will continue to appreciate in value, which means that even while that's increasing, um, the amount like 12.5 Bitcoins now is worth literally infinitely more than 50 Bitcoins in 2009, because in 2009, 50 Bitcoins was worth zero. Nobody so bought anything with Bitcoins, so yeah. they couldn't buy, yeah, they were worthless. Or something. Exactly, but now 12.5 uh, Bitcoins is, is thousands of dollars. Um, so um, that can be one part of the incentive, but you're right, so the other part of the incentive is people can offer fees, so with their transactions. So I told you a, a transaction is just a combination of inputs and a bunch of outputs. So what you can do is make the outputs worth less than the inputs. So I can send, I'm, I'm sending um, you know, 0.5 Bitcoins to Dave, I might um, make a transaction where I'm using an input of one Bitcoin. And now that's, that's a huge amount, that'd be a $500 fee. Um, you messed up if you paid that much. Um, but uh, you would do that, that 0.5 Bitcoin, the difference between the outputs and the input, that goes to the miner who includes that in a block. That, that goes into the Coinbase transaction. So what that means is in the future, what will also incentivize miners um, is an increase in fees. Um, so people, people will, uh, if, if there's, there's charts you can find online that'll track this like, over time, and the, the amount of fees uh, in Bitcoin have increased over time. Um, and that, that will continue to incentiv incentivize the miners to some degree. You know, uh, time will tell if our uh, you know, economic intuition with that is right. You know, that's, that's hard to say. I, I have uh, you know, hope that that will be, that'll be enough to incentivize the network. Because um, like even now, if, if total fees in that were more Let's go. Let's fast forward a couple halvings. It'll go to 6.25, um, you know, 3.125 or whatever. And it'll continue going like that. At some point, um, it won't be. It, it could be conceivable to imagine small amount of fees actually adding up to more than that, and that's actually being a a valuable uh, amount of coins. So, based on that scenario, what do you think the transaction? Fee, you know, the transaction fee will be once the Bitcoin starts <coughs> so down in value. Uh, it could it could be very high. <laughs> like um, it, I, it's hard to. I mean, this, it's a purely empirical thing, um, and we'd have to see you know where where supply and demand goes. Um, but uh, on the one hand, it could be it, people could find uh, ways to to scale the block size effectively. Um, there's a lot of debate in Bitcoin about how how you can. Um, right now, there's uh, a block is no no larger than one megabyte, um, 
and uh, that could change in the future. Um, yes. Oh no, I will oh, continue sorry. your thought. Yeah. Um, so uh, people people might be able to figure that, and if that that means that more supply, which means the amount for each transaction would need to w would need to be less in order to add up to the same amount. At the same time, it could also stay one megabyte forever. That is a possibility as well. And if that's the case, and the world has you know the market has decided that Bitcoin is is extremely valuable, it could mean that Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin transaction you know it's like fifty dollars to send you know a Bitcoin transaction. Uh, the thing to note is that's still extremely powerful because people people have sent you know million dollar transactions on the Bitcoin network before, uh, and it cost them pennies. Um, and even even to be able to send that amount of money uh, instantly uh, without a third party uh, anywhere in the world uh, for fifty bucks that's a, that's a steal. Um, so uh, you know supply and demand will have to have to tell us. Now, uh, what that means is it could be in the future that Bitcoin is not, like putting, putting a Bitcoin transaction in the blockchain is not the feasible way of paying for a coffee. Um, it could mean that it's, it's more feasible for, for large uh, monetary uh, <laughs> movement. On the other hand, uh, if we find another way, then we could continue to like to use it for, for small payments. That as uh, fees go up for those transactions, that people will be less likely to do those transactions, and then it's going to make Bitcoin a little bit less of a viable option. Right. Or yeah. yeah. So this is this is a very large debate in Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> uh, lots of different viewpoints. Uh, my personal view is like yes, like there might be uh, marginal transactions uh, that people decide <laughs> to use a different method for, um, but that doesn't detract from. Um, you know these these more powerful like w what Bitcoin offers is effectively a digital gold uh, online. So me not being able to pay for a coffee does not bother me as much. And I think Bitcoin can still offer the world something amazing by being this reserve currency, um, even if it's not the case that people can do that. Now, if we can figure out how to allow you know every everything to go on the blockchain, that'd be fantastic because it would keep things get, keep prices low for everyone. But Time will tell if that's actually a feasible option. Interesting, thank you. Yeah. Um, so other contracts that are variable, there's things like oracles, which would be like a, you know, you can have, you can entrust money with someone who, you know, like sports betting, where it's ESPN.com, and uh, you can program it. So, you know, if if uh, you know the the Spurs win that night, uh, money goes to this address. If the the um, you know Warriors or whoever. Uh, when that night the money goes uh, to that address. There's something called assurance contracts, which uses an opcode called um, anyone can pay, which effectively works as a, a Kickstarter type thing. So you can say, you can create a transaction that will not will not be valid after X date, and it requires you know one Bitcoin, so a thousand dollars, and anyone can add inputs to that transaction to add up. And as soon as it adds up to the amount that's valid, the blockchain will recognize it as valid, and you can spend it. And so you can build sort of uh, uh, these these assurance contracts. There's also uh, pay for proof and different puzzle things. Uh, recently, uh, SHA-1, uh, Google Google broke SHA-1, and there was a Bitcoin transaction put out by one of the core developers years ago that used the opcodes with the, the crypto to say if you could include information that showed you know, SHA-1, when you duplicate it, having like an equal thing, that the money would be spendable. So someone was able to spend that output by providing the the broken SHA-1 information and they got some Bitcoins. And there's there's ones out there for some other, like SHA-256 as well, which would be extremely valuable for Bitcoin to know is broken because the whole the whole mining operation is in consensus is built on it. Do you um, think so, that's, that's going to happen before 2140? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> or make 2140. But of, of course, like all of the uh, 2140 is when the last Bitcoin will be mined. Uh, but even then, mining continues because it's still doing the accounting. Uh, it's just that the the block reward will be zero. Um, that being said, Bitcoin is simply software. So if SHA-256 was broken, the whole network can like 
pause and be like, okay, we're going to start using SHOP3 now or, or some other. If ECDSA was found to be broken, people could move to something else. It would just require a, a new consensus to, to form and continue. So um, one last thing, and this is you know, kind of shilling for my own company, um, but uh, there's something called Payment Required, which is an HTTP code that's existed since the 90s um, but was never used, and now you actually can use it. We have a, a Python library called 2.1 that enables this with you know, one line on uh, Flask or Django. Um, and what that does, if someone makes a request to an API endpoint um, and does not include any money, they get back a 402 and nothing else. But if they include, um, so then it would also you know, give back like an address to send money to. If someone sent money to that address and then sent a proof with their next request to that same API, they would get back uh, the information they want because they proved that they paid for it. Um, so then you can you know, imagine a, a fun-filled cyberpunk future of, of you know, grid computing and, and stuff like that. Um, and you, you can start coding with this today using, using libraries like that. So, um, so recommended resources if you want to go forward. Um, and my questions, uh, my answers to your questions are enough. Uh, the Bitcoin white paper is a great place to, to go. It's still the, the best simple explanation of Bitcoin out there. You can find that at bitcoin.org or uh, an HTML version is on my website. Uh, the Bitcoin developer guide, as well as this book, Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos, are both fantastic resources for getting into the nitty gritty. Um, it gets into every single detail you could want. Um, the Mastering Bitcoin includes a lot of uh, Python examples, so you can work through the actual code of, of working with addresses and transactions and stuff like that. And uh, all of the graphics uh, from this came mostly from those two resources. If you want to learn more about the history and economics of Bitcoin and you know the cyberpunk movement and all of that, Nakamoto Institute um, and the Bitcoin Wiki is slightly outdated. I don't think it's been updated in many years, but for the most part, it still has uh, everything you would want to know about technical details. Um, so I'd recommend that as well at bitcoinit.it. So anyway, that's uh, my very quick overview of um, Bitcoin. Um, so let me know if you have any more questions. So the big institutions would be because they all have business models that rely on a fraudulent system of uh, fractional reserve banking. So of course, to to move to Bitcoin uh, is is a much greater threat. That being said, by them also developing technologies that upgrade their systems to use more cryptographically secure uh, methods of of handling their ledgers. Is, is a boon to everyone, and it's actually, I, I consider it orthogonal to Bitcoin in the sense that it's, those institutions will, will still need them for different kind of uh, trust relationships and loans and stuff like that. They just won't be able to, uh, like all of, all of that stuff that they build with blockchain technology will be denominated in, in a Bitcoin world, in Bitcoin, once Bitcoin has taken over. Uh, as far as other cryptocurrencies go, um, if you go to nakamotoinstitute.org, we have uh, some notorious articles uh, uh, slamming slamming altcoins. Um, I but think one's titled like "All Altcoins Must Die" or something like that. Uh, die in a fire. Not not die in a fire, but there's uh, the problem with bitcoins. Uh, there's uh, uh, oh man, what's like, anyway? The the long and short of it is, in I I wanted to focus on the tech. The technical tonight, the argument against altcoins is more of an economic one, and it's that a money uh, monies competing against one another will have one currency that dominates them all. We have we have the dollar uh, dominating right now, uh, partially because of legal tender, um, and actually legal tender is probably why more than you know one or a few uh, currencies exist in the world because people are able to you know force different jurisdictions to use 
a specific money, but when you have a free-for-all, money will tend, the universe will tend towards a single currency. Um, so uh, as, as the Bitcoin network grows, uh, it's, it's less and less valuable to want to hold a, a currency that's not Bitcoin for the purposes of currency. Um, and we, we predict that, that Bitcoin would win out. Um, there's, there's a number of issues that I see with Ethereum, but um, it's probably a little too complex for, uh, for right here. Um, uh, effectively, I mean, part of it is like the, the complexity of it has caused a lot of security issues. We've seen uh, the DAO got hacked, which was massive, uh, you know, fundamental, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, virtual machine issue. Uh, with the Ethereum network, um, and there's been there's been a, a number of forks in the network, meaning consensus has broken, um, and this is that that's been problematic. Um, and other uh, other ones, altcoins have come and gone. There's always a lot of hype cycles, but all of them have have, you know, at, at best gotten a big hype and then kind of drifted away. So I, I haven't seen any that strike me as a a true competitor to Bitcoin yet. Anyone else? I was going to ask you, um, can you join us on, your, on our show? In sure. Okay, cool. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Do you think, do you see side changes uh, essential to the future widespread adoption of Bitcoin? Uh, I don't know if they're essential, but they're certainly interesting. So side chains is a way to create an additional uh, chain that does not so when, when people start up Litecoin or Ethereum or Zcash or any of these others, they're creating a, a whole new network um, to do it in. So it needs, it needs a new network effect to gain support. Um, sidechains is a way to peg a chain to Bitcoin so that you can create Bitcoin but with X feature still using the value of the Bitcoin network as well as a lot of the security. And I do think that that's uh, a very interesting proposition, both for uh, development in terms of you know being able to try a new feature in Bitcoin, but also competing with altcoins because you know why why create a whole new network if you have a new feature you want to add to Bitcoin when you can just create one on the Bitcoin network uh, using a side chain and develop it. And if the market decides to treat that as the Bitcoin, the market has just moved to that, and it just everything continues it's not it's not having to compete in the same way does anyone else have a question while he tries to remember so somebody with a lot of computing power let's say Amazon could do a lot of transactions really quick and they could charge for those transactions They didn't release that Bitcoin back into back into circulation. They just started dominating the Bitcoin market. Uh, what do you mean exactly? Like if they started hoarding mm -hmm. some Bitcoins? Uh, I would I would view that as great for the network. I, I am a, a huge proponent of hoarding as many Bitcoins as possible. Um, <laughs> because by doing so, you increase the value of all the Bitcoins on the network and then incentivize <coughs> other people to want to hold Bitcoin themselves and use it um, for, for various uh, projects if they have if they have something they can spend Bitcoin on. So um, large players uh, getting a lot of Bitcoin is, is one, the, the way of the world, but also something that I, I support and uh, encourage. Um, so. so since Bitcoin is completely decentralized and there's no central committee that makes decisions as to what features get into Bitcoin and not into Bitcoin, what is the mechanism for the entire Bitcoin network coming to consensus on the next version of Bitcoin is this, and it's going to include all the previous features or these features, like some of the old yeah. features are going away, here are new features. So there's a great art article by my friend uh, Daniel on, our, on, on the Nakamoto Institute website called Who Controls Bitcoin? And uh, so yeah, this is more, more economic, but basically, um, it is, it is the users that control Bitcoin. By users, I mean investors of Bitcoin, the people who hold Bitcoin. 
um, because they get to decide what is actually valuable to do on the network. Now, a miner can, uh, you know, uh, mine blocks that don't have any transactions in it, effectively like censoring a group of people in a sense of like, well, they didn't pay me enough, and so they don't get to spend money on my network. And if they have enough of the computing power, 51%, I didn't, I didn't get into that today, but if they have enough, they can, they can sort of block these things on the network. However, um, these types of actions, if, if, that person, if that person has any interest in, in seeing Bitcoin continue, then they also have to make sure that Bitcoin stays profitable uh, for themselves as well. So that kind of deters some of that. Um, so it's only if that kind of person really hates Bitcoin um, and wants to see it destroyed that it could turn into something malicious. Although even then, the people who invest in Bitcoin can then just say, well, I uh, starting now, I only believe that people using this mining algorithm uh, is something that's valuable. And thus, all these people who devoted mining resources to SHA-256, that's no longer profitable. So they, they invested all these resources to attack Bitcoin in a way that is, is rendered moot by, by the people on the network. Uh, likewise, like you could have malicious developers you know, that trick people into doing something they didn't want about the network. But once again, um, you know, and of course this, this requires people to, to keep track of what's going on um, in, in development and what's going on on their own computers. Um, but if like a developer were to make a new feature for Bitcoin and come out to the world and say, hey, I made this thing that I think is great for Bitcoin, the network as a market can decide, is Bitcoin more valuable if this feature exists? <coughs> if they say yes, then all those investors have decided yes, and you know it can, it can be added to the network. We've seen this happen before. Um, or they can say, no, I don't really like that feature, so it's not going to be a part. So that developer can only actually get their feature mm -hmm. into the network if the market has of, of investors have decided, yeah, that actually makes my investment valuable. Um, so, for instance, right now, uh, there's, there's a feature called Segregated Witness, or SegWit, that is trying to make its way into the network, and, you know, the Bitcoin Core guys worked on it for, you know, over a year, worked very hard, some <coughs> most brilliant guys putting their minds to this, and right now, uh, it has about 23% of, of uh, support in the blocks, there's, there's a mechanism for being able to, uh, 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 tell the network like how much like how many miners support uh, adding a feature but um, if uh, it, and it needs like 95% or something like that and right now it has 23% and so SegWit might actually not happen it also could we don't know um, if it doesn't happen that's actually the network saying no we decided that we don't like your feature and so we're going to continue doing it our way so the the investors remain sovereign um, so everything depends on what do they think is valuable. What is a miner? Okay, so a miner is the person who's <coughs> devoting computational resources to uh, create consensus in the network. So do you remember, I don't remember if you came in late, um, but we have, we have what's called proof of work. And every time we want to add a block to the network, a, a person called a miner is devoting computational resources to produce a number that shows that they added a bunch of computational resources to the network to show that they made an economic cost um, to do that, yes. meaning it's, it's, more, uh, it's more profitable to be honest, essentially. I mean, it can be extremely costly to be dishonest. Thank you. Anyone else? I guess, I guess not. So um, thank you very much for uh, listening in, and I, I hope you have uh, more interest in Bitcoin. Um, if if you think you, if if you're interested in uh, investing, don't think you're too late because it's a thousand now, and it'll be ten million later. So you're still an early adopter if you uh, if you jump in. Uh, but that's not that's not investment advice. I'm not a, not a professional. So, thank you.